Welcome to the first lecture on module six on recommendation systems. This is part one. When we talk about recommendation systems, we get to move on from this idea of just standard data mining algorithms where we talk about clustering uh, and analyzing graphs, hashing, dimensionality reduction, the topics that we've discussed over the past several modules. And now we get to talk more about how these data mining algorithms get used to extract insights. But the insights we're looking for here are recommendations. So we want to try and recommend an object or an item or a document or a picture or, or a tweet or some advertisement to a user or individual based on their previous behavior or based on their network, in, the network location or their social network, this kind of information. And this idea shouldn't be new to you if you've spent any kind of, of time on the internet. Uh, so if you go to Amazon, you go to Netflix or a number of these different places, you'll see things like video recommended for you. YouTube has got lots of these. Uh, or Amazon may recommend books to you or clothes to you. And the question is, how do we get insights about what a particular individual may like using all the information that we have and the algorithms that we have at our disposal based on online behavior, data logs, uh, previous purchase history. So in week one, we'll get to talk about this. Uh, first off, we'll talk about recommendation systems and several examples about how they exist on the web. Then we'll talk about content-based recommendation and contrast that with collaborative filtering-based recommendation. Content-based is where we use characteristics or features of, of the actual item to recommend similar items, which may sound familiar to you. Whereas collaborative filtering is more social network-based. We'll talk about that next week. Uh, but this week, you should be able to at least contrast the differences between these two. Then we'll talk about methods for characterizing item content. So since this week focuses on content-based recommendation, how do we actually characterize items based on their content? And then once we have characterizations of items, how do we aggregate users' behaviors based on their interactions with previous items or previous interactions with items to characterize their preferences and then compare items and their characterizations with users and the characterizations of items that they like. So over the past several months, we've been talking about the core motivation for this class in that we want to make the web more useful and informative. And one of the core ways we've done this is to group content on the web. We talked about clustering, we've talked about finding communities and networks, all kinds of, of ways to cluster or group content. Because the idea is if we have this big graph of different kinds of pages or different kinds of products in a particular space or on the web, that these groups tell us something valuable about the topic or kind of, of, of content that's embedded in a particular area. So if I go to Amazon and I click on a particular item, then I can very easily see that this item is part of this, this group or cluster, and then the system can show you other items that are also part of this cluster. So if I click on a book about Jaguar cars, then I will see a, a list of other items that people have bought that are similar to this particular item. And by leveraging the cluster or the group structure, uh, the grouping structure in this network, we can pull this kind of information out. But in the example I just showed you, we sort of assume that a user has clicked on a particular item in order to see what other items might be similar to that item. So then you can think of that, that selection or process as kind of a query mechanism. So I search for a particular item and then when I look through the listings of all items that somebody may have, I click on one, and then I want to find other items that are similar to that. Uh, but what if we could actively provide recommendations or actively suggest content to a user before they ever even have to search for a particular piece of content? So say you go to Amazon, and Amazon will show you a website about a number of, of items that they think you might like. So say you've pur purchased this item, this purple item, and this other purple item in the past, using this information, Amazon can then sh share you or show you, uh, oh, you may like this jacket, or you may like this pen lock, or you may like this, this helmet based on what you've looked at previously. So by using not just what, in, what particular item you're looking at today or in this particular session, the system can develop sort of a profile of your interests and then show you content or recommend content to you based on that previous, those previous interactions. Now this isn't perfect, certainly, I mean, I've already bought a new motorcycle helmet, so it's maybe not, not reasonable for Amazon to be showing me a lot of this content or recommending me new helmets, but maybe the jacket or the pen lock would be a useful recommendation. 
And we see this kind of, of system in place all over the internet. So YouTube relies pretty heavily on a recommendation system to show you videos that maybe you've watched or maybe you haven't that the system thinks you will like based on your previous behavior, the videos that you've watched before, how long you've watched those videos, maybe the things you've searched for, a number of different aspects of prior behavior, or maybe not even your behavior, but behavior of people who are near you to show you other kinds of videos that you may like, or other kinds of videos based on what your friends have been watching. Uh, so in YouTube, if you are on Google and share uh, information with Google about who your friends are, then Google can also, or YouTube can also show you or recommend videos to you based on your friends recommended videos. It's generally if I show, if, if I have a number of friends who have all liked a video, I will probably like that video as well. Netflix has the same kind of thing where based on your previous watch history, how long you've watched a particular video, how many episodes of a show you've watched, whether you've rated it, though I think Netflix no longer does uh, five star ratings, they just do, I think, up and down, do you like it or not kind of ratings. They can show you other kinds of content that they think you'll like. So it, it, you have your list of things that you've actively selected as things you want to watch. And then you have other lists of things that are popular on Netflix that Netflix thinks you, thinks you may enjoy. So then we have to talk about, or you might have, the system has to figure out ways to balance, you know, what's popular on, a, on the platform versus what do you like based on your interests, and then merge these or aggregate these kinds of information together. Netflix and YouTube are not the only places to do that, of course. Spotify does this same kind of thing based on popularity of music, whether you've listened to a particular art, artist before, or song characterizations, you know, what's the beat structure of a particular uh, of a particular song compared to another. There's a lot of ways that you can do this similarity assessment between songs or between videos or between items to then show you new kinds of content that you may like based on previous behavior. Google advertising is also a very similar or also relies on a very similar kind of mechanism. So remember with advertising, Advertising platforms like Google or Facebook want to show you ads that you're likely to enjoy or likely to click on because ads that you click on or ads that you're going to react to are going to make them more money. So they want to show you the best ads, the ads that are most tailored to your particular interest. And recommendation systems work based on these ideas and are relied on very heavily by advertising engines like Google. Uh, TikTok is a really is another really good example of, of recommendation systems as well because TikTok relies very heavily on recommendations to show you new videos. So now we've talked about a number of different examples of recommendation systems on the web and almost assuredly you could come up with many more. So now let's talk about what this may look like and how it's not just a question about giving you content that you may enjoy as a consumer. It turns out that recommendation systems are super valuable for content creators or runners of the system as well. So in advertising, we already showed you, the whole point of advertising is to get you to click on an ad or purchase a product. So these advertising systems want to show you content that's, recommend, that, that's most relevant to you. But we can go further than this and, and we've seen that recommendation systems also expose people to content that otherwise may never have been seen before. So it has real value for content creators as well. So previously you may have to rely on uh, advertising or on piggybacking off of the or the endorsement of some celebrity to get your content out there. But now with the advent of recommendation systems that put content that people like or people may like in front of those people in an automated way, these systems can present new content that otherwise wouldn't be seen to a wider audience. So that this example from Amazon, uh, back in, in the late 90s, this book came out Into Thin Air, which is a personal account of, of a disaster on Mount Everest. Now, this book became a bestseller, it was, it was very popular, but several years, almost a decade before this book came out, another book came out called Touching the Void, which is also about mountain climbing on Everest. And after a, uh, a while of Into Thin Air being uh, available on Amazon's platform, the buying behavior of people who were purchasing Into Thin Air suggested that people who were purchasing Into Thin Air also seemed to enjoy this book, Touching the Void, that had already been out for, for 10 years. And through this recommendation system, by 
telling people, hey, if you liked Into Thin Air, you'll probably like Touching the Void as well. Touching the Void became a bestseller also, also as a result of this recommendation. And in fact, a lot of people think that Touching the Void is a superior book to Into Thin Air. And Touching the Void would not have re reached the same level of notoriety had it not been for Amazon's recommendation of it. So the phenomenon that's at play here is that in websites like YouTube or Facebook or Amazon uh, or Netflix, a huge amount of content is available on this platform. So you could imagine all the different artists and songs that are being uploaded to Spotify or uploaded to SoundCloud or uploaded to YouTube at any given moment. Way too much for any one person to ever, ever consume. So how do we get access or how do we get exposure to that new content to the people who care about it? And the recommendation systems is one way to do that. And this, this introduction of recommendation systems into the digital world was a revolutionary thing because in the physical world, if you own a store, even if you're in a place like New York that has you know, a huge volume and a huge population of people you can, you can show content to, uh, so there's lots of opportunity for niche markets, physical stores are intrinsically cons constrained by space, meaning that you can't have you know, every possible item in the world available for purchase in a physical store. You have to allocate shelf space in your store to content that you think lots of people are gonna purchase to make effective use of, of, of that space. You can only have so much content there or so many items on your shelf that you think lots of people are gonna buy. So in the mid 2000s, a study was done that actually compared, well, what kind of content is available in both brick and mortar stores and in online spaces? And what, we, what they found was actually the vast majority of content, uh, or the vast majority of songs were only available in online spaces. And the songs that were available in both brick and mortar stores like Walmart and Rhapsody together uh, accounted for not a huge portion of the actual revenue of content that was that was being created and this this result was uh consistent across a number of different spaces so in rhapsody you know in this old study there were 735,000 songs in rhapsody's inventory but an order of magnitude smaller set of songs that actually you could go out to walmart and buy Amazon and Netflix were similar. Amazon has millions of books in their inventory, but if you were to go to Barnes Noble, only you know, 100,000 of those books may be available in brick and mortar stores. But more importantly, if you look at the growth and the sales of content from these online retailers, actually a large portion of their income came from this content that was not available in a brick and mortar store. So if you're at Amazon, you have essentially infinite shelf space uh, because you don't have to have a brick and mortar store that somebody has to come in and, and look for a, a book. You can have automated systems or, or warehouse workers go and find that item and put it into a box for you. So this phenomenon of all of this content in this long tail of this distribution is important for online retailers because this is actually where a lot of money is made because you can tailor content in this long tail to very niche markets and say, well, if you liked some particular, uh, some particular movie or some particular song or some particular book, there are probably some other uh, books or titles that are, that are similar to that, but they wouldn't be popular enough to make it onto a shelf in a, in a store somewhere, but we can make this available in an online marketplace. So this long tail phenomenon is, is a really important aspect of why recommendation systems are used in places like online retailers where getting exposure to new content that you may not be able to find elsewhere has real value both to the customer and to the retailer. But that's not to say that recommendation systems are only good things on the, on the internet. Uh, in fact, a couple of years ago, Zeynep Tufekci released this opinion piece in the New York Times talking about YouTube and how the recommendation systems on YouTube radicalized people because YouTube's, or the claim was that YouTube's recommendation systems optimized for engagement. They wanted to show you content that you were more likely to watch and watch for long periods of time, and content that was more likely to get you to stay on YouTube's platform for longer. And the claim was that by optimizing for engagement, by showing you things that you're more likely to spend a lot, a lot of time watching, that a certain population would be fed content that was politically extreme, or radical, and the more of this content they consumed, the more radical they became. 
And this was covered more uh, back in 2019 and has been a significant issue for YouTube that they have to overcome. And YouTube is actively trying to address this issue uh, in how their platform is used or how their platform can be abused. And this is driven by, by recommendations as well. So now that we've talked about the context in which recommendation systems exist in online spaces, let's talk a little bit about how we actually recommend this content to people. Based on the assignments that I've given you in the past, you actually have already done this to some degree. So I've asked you in assignment three to identify some data set, search for a couple of items in that data set that are quote unquote query entities, and then find other pieces of content uh, that are similar to those query entities. And that essentially is the process of content-based recommendation, where we have some item uh, or some set of items, we want to characterize those, characterize those items, and then find other similar items to that item. Alternatively, perhaps we have a network of people and we have information about what these people have bought or purchased or liked or engaged with over time. So here in the top, maybe we have information about how all these people uh, liked a particular item or a particular video X. So if we want to understand, well, what happens with this person in the middle, this Mickey Yavo guy, well, because of the way the network structure is, you know, one of the things we've talked about is nodes that are close together in the network are likely to be similar to each other, more likely to be similar to each other than they are to other nodes far away in the network. So odds are, based on what we know from this graph, that this guy, Mike Yavo, probably also likes item X based on how many of his neighbors likes item X. This is a phenomenon called homophily. We'll talk about that next week. But this is also how something like TikTok will show you content that's not just pop popular or related to the content you've watched, but is also popular in your particular geographic area. And this is the idea behind collaborative filtering based recommendation, where I don't have to know about uh, the content of a particular item. Maybe I don't know how to characterize uh, an image or I don't know how to correctly characterize a, a, a song, but I can see that many people in a particular area or many people in a particular community like that song. So a new, new person in that community is also likely to enjoy that song. And then you do the same thing with advertising. Uh, many of your friends were shown this particular ad and many of them clicked on it. So odds are you're likely to click on this ad as well. Assignment four, which talks about clustering, is a thing that you can actually do to exploit this network structure. So you, you go and look in, this, in these clusters that you've built and find important items in, in these different clusters. Uh, you can actually use that information as a way to recommend new content from that cluster. So that gives you some idea about how to, con uh, how to do this recommendation from a very high level, methods based on content or content characterization, which is what we'll talk about today, and then methods based on the social network or the collaborative filtering aspect, which we'll talk about next time. So let's formalize this, this idea of recommendation systems. So the formal model here is we have some set of people, individuals, or customers. It's our set X. We have some set of items that we want to recommend. Maybe they're products to sell, videos to watch, advertise, or advertisements to show, etc. And what we want to do is create some function that takes the combination of people and items and produces some rating. And this rating is a way for us to evaluate, well, how likely is a particular user or a particular individual to enjoy, how likely is it for that individual to enjoy or uh, engage with a particular item. So this rating at the end is, allows us to build a ranking of this content uh, so we can look at any pair of items in this set and say, you know, these, this item is higher ranked than this other item. And you'll see this, like some examples on Amazon, uh, the, these five stars, so that R, this rating is that five star rating. Um, we want to show content to you that you would likely rate as being five stars. The five star aspect is something you see in a lot of places, uh, but it's not the only way to do this. You could also maybe just have whether somebody's read a book or not, or whether they've watched a uh, movie or not, uh, or how long they've watched that movie. Something like Goodreads has this uh, in the read or not read, or read, not read, or continuing to read uh, classification as well that you may also be able to use. So given that utility function, we have this utility matrix of, of, of people and the items that we care about. 
And for this utility matrix, we see that this matrix is sparse and we get some idea of a rating or some reaction from the individuals in our rows to the items in our columns. And maybe this tells us like Alice has watched Avatar, Carol has watched Matrix. Uh, the matrix or maybe these are these are ratings and alice has given a hundred percent liking to avatar uh, but only a twenty percent uh liking to the matrix if you think about these as stars uh alice gave five star five out of five stars to avatar and only one out of five stars to the matrix crucially though this matrix is not full not everybody or the vast majority of people in your data set or in the real world do not interact with the vast majority of content or the vast majority of items you have. So this matrix is incomplete. And what we wanna do with this utility function is say, given this matrix of rows corresponding to, to X, these are our, our individuals, and columns corresponding to our items S, we want to then infer ratings for each one of these empty cells. So how likely is it that Alice will, will give a high score or a high rating to the Lord of the Rings? Or what rating would she give to Pirates of the Caribbean? Or what rating would Carol give to Lord of the Rings? What function can we, can we construct based on this set of, of ratings that we can extract to infer new ratings for content that people haven't seen before? So the key problems that we have to deal with here are one, how do we actually get ratings to populate this matrix? Uh, so where do we get those ones or 0.2s or 0.4s from? Uh, two is the crucial part, how do we actually extract or, or infer what these unknown ratings are uh, for content that a particular person has, has not interacted with yet from content that, or from interactions that we do know or ratings that we can see. Crucially though, as with the similarity assessment piece, or the similarity mo module that we talked about, we really don't care so much about content that it, you're not going to rate highly. So in the same way that we don't care about pairs of items that are very dissimilar. So for the uh, men hash case, we're trying to identify pairs of items that are likely to be more similar than some threshold. Here we'll do the same thing. We don't actually care about getting uh, really fine grain ratings or rankings for things that you don't care about. So we don't actually have to fully populate this utility matrix. We only have to populate it with content or ra ratings for things that are likely to receive high ratings. So we only have to show you a few new items rather than have to infer a rating for all possible items in this matrix. And then the third problem that we have to evaluate or understand is actually how do we measure how well these uh, inference methods or this extrapolation process really works. Uh, ideally, we want to be able to, to know that given a new rating or a new recommend recommended item that you are going to click on that or that we should have confidence that you'll actually click on that ad or buy that, that item. How do we evaluate that? So for the first question, the first question is actually relatively straightforward. We want to gather ratings, right? Uh, this is not a data science question, or this is not really a data mining question, so much as an engineering question for a particular interface. So we can build some interface that asks people to rate items. Uh, this is like Movie Rate, or IMDb, or Goodreads, or Amazon Reviews, or Yelp. In all of those places, the information that you provide, the ratings that you provide, is actually hugely useful information for places like Yelp or Google, who are gonna use that information to then build new recommendations. So you can actually ask for people uh, to provide you these ratings. The difficulty here, though, is that, as I mentioned, most people don't interact with most things. So you, it's actually very hard to get ratings for large amounts of content especially for content that's not popular or content that's very niche. Uh, it's unlikely that people will just provide you or like the small audience for very niche content uh, will get ratings from enough people to understand something about that content. So an alternative way is to do this implicitly where we look at user users actions or logs that we can pull from uh, online spaces. So web logs or click logs on websites uh, you may see on Amazon or advertisements that you click on on a particular site. Uh, so Google can actually see, you know, 
this person clicked on or this ad was clicked on from this from this website so we can learn the interaction patterns here to say well if if we assume that clicking on something or purchasing an item is an endorsement of that item or a high rating for that item then that's another way we can get these ratings again the difficulty here is while we may get more data this way because we're not actively asking people uh, to go out of their way to provide us recommendations generally we don't have a good way of understanding whether somebody doesn't like something so when I explicitly ask you hey did you like this movie how many stars would you give this movie uh, if I don't like that movie I can give it a one star out of five with the implicit rating uh, or the implicit feedback mechanism well maybe you just didn't see a particular ad or you didn't click on it uh, you didn't know a movie existed to go watch it, or you didn't uh, click on an item because you found some other item first, or you didn't see that item. The implicit review or implicit rating mechanism only generally gives you insight about high ratings or the positive side of things. So you miss out on information about low ratings. But again, like I said, that's generally an engineering question. The recommendation system piece, the core of what we want to talk about, comes from this extrapolation of new ratings. The key problem here is we have this matrix and it's intrinsically sparse, it's intrinsically incomplete. Most people have not rated most of the items that are there. So how can we fill in those holes uh, for a particular user? How can we show that user new items that they, that they should enjoy? And this problem gets even more complicated when we deal with what's called cold starts. Uh, if a new item comes into our inventory, no one has, has reviewed it before, uh, no one's clicked on it before, how do we ever recommend that content or that item to somebody? And a new user comes in to our store, our online, uh, our online space, and that user has no purchase history, that user has no interaction history. How do we know what that person likes in order to show them content that, that, that they might like? So these are the kinds of pr uh, problems that we'll talk about when, or over the course of the next three weeks. And then we have this question of evaluation. So this is a, actually a, a non-trivial research area about how do we evaluate this. Uh, we'll talk about this in more depth uh, later on in this module. All right, so we've talked about what the general construct is for recommendation systems. We've talked about a formalization for recommendation. How do we actually get at recommending content or characterizing items so we know what to recommend for the content-based recommendation system approach? So as I mentioned, we've already done this to a degree in assignment three, where I asked you to come up with some data set, uh, either build your own or pull some pre-existing one, and come up with a way to evaluate similarity. The similarity here, how you evaluate whether two items are similar or how similar are two items, is exactly the kind of thing that we want to do. So the main idea, we have some customer, and we want to show that cu customer new content that they are likely to rate highly, but they've never rated before. So Examples you may see are movie recommendations. This is definitely what Netflix is doing, uh, where Netflix might show you a, a new movie. But for content-based recommendation, we can't just rely, or we sh we're not relying on like your network or what your friends are, or looking at or what's popular in a particular area. Instead, we want to characterize something about the movie. So we want to show you movies that have similar actors, or movies that are directed by the same director, or fall into the same genre. What do we know about the movie or a set of movies that we can use to evaluate similarity between pairs of movies? Same thing with websites or blogs or, or uh, online, online spaces or online content or books. We can look at the text of these books or text of these, of these pages and characterize the content therein or the text therein and show you other sites or other books uh, that have similar kinds of content. Now, how you operationalize the similarity assessment is really one of the core pieces of, of content-based recommendation. Uh, because movies are not just about their actors and directors. Books are not just about the words on the page. You can also look at genres. This is why you see Netflix with uh, movies with a strong female lead or movies about uh, zombies, these kinds of things that you get these genres and sub-genres sub uh, that also contribute a lot to or a lot of signal about what you may like. So the general plan that we, we will follow for content-based recommendation is we have some user who has given us some information about things that that user has enjoyed. And we can look at these, these items 
that they've liked and we can describe something about them. So here, this user has liked two items that are red, one's a red circle, one's a red triangle. We use this set of items that this person has liked to build a profile of things that this person likes in general. Is this, is this person's interest based on the shape of these objects or is it based on the color of these objects? Do they only like circles? Do they only like triangles, etc.? In this case, it appears that this person likes anything that's red. So then we can build this user profile to say, well, what are the interests of this person? This person likes red things. So then we can go look at other objects that this person's never looked at before and never purchased before and say, oh, well, here's an, another red shape. I don't care about what the actual shape is. This person seems to like red objects. So then we'll recommend this red shape to this person or this red item to this person. So what does this look like for items or for content-based recommendation? So the question here that we need to answer for items first is how we create these item profiles. So we've done this. This is exactly the kinds of thing that, that you did with similarity assessment. It's essentially what we want to do is build some feature vector for all the items in our set. And there are a bunch of examples that you may have here. So you may have uh, with movies, we've already talked about genres and actors and directors. Books, we've already talked about the sets of words in the document. You may use genre here as well. For images, you can use tags. So if you're on Flickr, if you're on uh, Adobe Stock or uh, something along some some stock photo place, a lot of these photos come with tags. And if you like or are searching for a particular tag, we'll show you other other images that also have that same tag. Uh, for products that we wanna that we wanna sell, maybe we'll. Uh, characterize that product based on its price, some description of that product, uh, what kind of category it's in, is it automotive, or is it, is it uh, clothing, uh, what kind of clothing for season, or what kind, of, what kind of style is it. Same thing with restaurants, you may have price or cuisine type, uh, ambiance, a lot of information that Yelp may provide about attire or noise or alcohol, etc. Lots of, of these kinds of features that you can use to evaluate similarity between things. So in movies, we, like I said, we may use casts or we may use the uh, network of movies to characterize actors that may, that may be particularly interesting for a movie. So cast lists for movies are giant, right? So maybe you don't care about uh, who was the particular, like some particular set designer, uh, if we want to recommend some movie, but we may care a lot about um, core actors or, or major celebrities, A-list actors, and we'll show you movies based on other A-list actors or show you movies that have similar A-list actor cast lists. For text, we've already talked about ways where we can do uh, text mining using shingling. Uh, the idea is we can break down texts into individual tokens or terms. These are our features. And rather than talking about products or items that we sell, the documents can be, or the items can be documents. So like I said, we've already talked about shingling as one way to characterize or build uh, characterization of these, of these documents. Another approach is to use what's called TFIDF, or term frequency inverse document frequency. This is a measure that lets you say for a particular token, how common is that token across the entire data set versus in that particular word. So that's the term frequency is how common is that document or how common is that is that uh, term in a particular document. And then the inverse document frequency is a way to weight based on the number of, of different documents in which that, that particular keyword has shown up. So for things like stop words, so the, and, or words that appear in many, many documents, those are not really interesting words. So we can reweight uh, words that are unique or words that show up only in a core set, some particular set of documents. Same way that you would do if you were trying to figure out what's the what actors are most likely to be uh, the most central and or the most important in identifying what movies you like that I talked about a minute ago. So you may apply page rank to the graph of actors. You could apply TFIDF to the tokens in a document. So there are a couple of ways that you can characterize content or characterize items an item's content. So going back to our plan of action, we already have a way to assess similarity among items. This is the thing that we've talked about. Now we wanna talk about how we characterize the individual. Going back to our example, 
So if you look at a particular item, we can say, well, we've placed this item in a, in a particular cluster in our graph. Let's show other items to you that are also in that, in that graph. So this is actually one way to view this problem of characterizing users. So we have this utility matrix, say this particular user, say U2, only ever purchased one item. So given that one item, we can say actually the user profile for that particular user is actually the same as the item profile for that one item that person has bought. So then all we have to do is find other items that are most similar to the one item that somebody has, has purchased. And we already have a way to do that based on sorting the items in our item set and pulling out the top K items that we want to recommend. But things get a little bit more complicated when a user has multiple items that they've purchased or multiple items that they've recommended or multiple items they've endorsed or interacted with. So here, say U3 has purchased item two and item M. How do we do that? How do we combine these features? So naive profile may just say, well, we have the feature vectors for item two and the feature vector for item M. Let's just take the average of these two, uh, of these two feature vectors and then we do the same thing. This average of these two vectors becomes the user profile. They exist in the same space as our individual items because it's made up of a combination of items. And then again, we just sort based on what either items in our item set are most similar to this user profile. Now this works fine for the, for the binary case, uh, but we can get more sophisticated, right? So in the example that I showed you from Netflix or from Amazon, Cells aren't yes or no, did I purchase an item or not? Cells also include you know, ratings, five-star ratings, four-star ratings. Uh, if you're on Netflix, maybe it's the number of, of episodes of a show you've watched. If you're on YouTube, it's how much of a particular video did you watch? So it's not just this binary thing. So another way we can do this is to take the weighted average over the items. So if we, in the past, or in the, in the previous slide I showed you, we just take the average over all the items I've interacted with. Here, we can actually take a weighted average based on which one was the, which item had the highest rating, or of the possible ratings that I've given, uh, we will make items that I've given high ratings to worth more. It's another way to aggregate these items together to create the user profile. And we have a complication though. Not everybody rates the kinds of things the same way. So just because I rate a particular video as a four, four stars out of five uh, doesn't mean that you're gonna rate that video as four stars, even if you and I like that video to the same degree. Uh, so these ratings could mean something to, or mean different things to different people. Uh, so I am actually much, much less likely to give super high ratings to my Uber drivers, whereas my wife is likely to be very lenient. Uh, so my average rating is generally lower, or my wife's rating is, is on average higher. So if we want to compare uh, these user profiles, especially if we're doing this weighted average, then we need to account for differences, general differences in whether a particular user is more likely to rate high or low. So we can actually do this as well by normalizing my ratings based on whatever my average is. So you look at the set of items for which I've given some rating, figure out what that average is, and you could subtract that average from all of my ratings. So that puts us into a more even footing, that even though my wife is more likely to give a, on average, higher rating, uh, you subtract off her, that average from all of her ratings and subtract off my average from all of my ratings, and we have a more consistent kind of comparison. So there are other ways to get more sophisticated here. There are pros and cons to the content-based approach. So. Now that we have a good understanding of how content-based recommendation works, let's talk about the nice things about it, the shortcomings to it, and use it as motivation for next time when we talk about collaborative filtering. So first, the pros for content-based recommendation. Uh, nicely, we don't have to rely on data for other users. So in general, I don't have to care about somebody else's ratings uh, to figure out a rating for me. As long as I've given you some rating, or some set of behaviors or some set of interactions with items, and we know how to characterize items. New items aren't a huge problem because we can characterize them. We know how to do that based on the text or the actors or product description, all the examples that I've given you before. Even if a particular user has super niche tastes, that's not a huge problem uh, because I can get very specific in their, in their interests and look for other content that's similar. So I don't have to rely again on other people's behavior. 
Uh, I can recommend new items, no problem, because I can I know how to characterize them. And even if an item is very unlikely to to ever been rated or seen by other users, again, this is not a problem because I can characterize the content of that item. The item exists, I can characterize it. And then finally, I can explain why I've recommended this item to you. Because we're doing content-based recommendation, I have features that I can point to and say, well, you like this project or this, this, or we think you'll like this item or this movie because it has the same actor or same director as this other movie. So you can provide that kind of explanation. The cons though, are that characterizing this content is non-trivial. Finding content or finding the right feature set is not easy, especially if you're talking about images or music. Uh, where the feature space can be quite broad. How do we recommend content for users who have never engaged with our platform before? Uh, again, not easy. Uh, it, we require some, some prior history or prior behavior in order to know what this weighting should be. And then finally, the content-based approach generally is over-specified, that I can really only show you content that's similar to other content that you've liked, uh, based on however I've quantified characterizations of that content. And I have really have no way of evaluating whether other people thought that content was good. So ideally I want to look at content that my friends all like or that my friends or that, that people I know uh, gave high quality judgments to. We have no real way of doing that based on content-based approaches. So with a collaborative filtering-based approach, we can do that. We can rely on, on what are the ratings of the people around me. And in fact, we can do the, that evaluation, what are the ratings of the people around me without ever even knowing what the content of a particular item may be. And in fact, the collaborative filtering based approach uh, won the Netflix prize for a couple of years uh, back in the late 2000s and early 2010s because characterizing movies genres and and you know, movie movie types or, or moods uh, is a non-trivially difficult task but by relying on on just similarities between user preferences well if you liked these three movies and other people who liked these three movies also like this fourth movie odds are you're likely to like this fourth movie let's show you that one it actually works very well in practice so that concludes what we've talked. We want to, what I wanted to cover about introducing you to recommendation systems and collaborative filtering and content-based recommendation. So you now should have a number of ways or a number of examples about recommendation systems on the web. Should be able to tell the major differences between content-based and collaborative filtering-based recommendations. Talk about methods for characterizing content, either via you know, the movies in, or the actors in a particular movie, or the text in a document, or the product descriptions, or the, or the attire or cuisine types, all these different things. And then you should be able to explain how you might aggregate a user's preferences, either just taking simple averages of the items they've liked, or weighted averages, um, normalization methodology, or norm normalization methods. We've touched on all of these things. So, if you have any questions about content-based recommendation or recommendation systems in general, uh, feel free to post in the discussion forum.